Welcome to TV Church. I'm Kristen, minister to kids and families at First Baptist Huntsville. Don't be confused, this is not the end of the broadcast where I usually make my appearance, sitting on a couch and signing off for the day. This week, I have the privilege of sharing some thoughts with you. If you've joined us for the last few weeks, you know that Travis is in the middle of a series on the parables of Jesus. I looked at the ones he was planning to cover so I could see what was left. Among those was today's parable, commonly known as the workers in the vineyard. And I chose it because it was my least favorite. Frankly, I've always found this parable to be threatening. I identify far too well with the so-called bad guys in the story, and the conclusion is hard to stomach. So I figured God probably had some things to teach me and that I might be able to pass those along to you. Let me tell you something about kids in general, since that's supposed to be my area of expertise, and my kids in particular. I don't know how they pick it up, but it seems that all kids from a very early age learn the phrase, that's not fair. It can be applied to any number of situations. Perhaps their bedtime is a half hour earlier than a sibling's. That, of course, is not fair. Or maybe something comes up and your plans change and you can't take them to the pool today. That is not fair. Or someone else got to choose the TV channel or play with a toy longer or got a bigger scoop of ice cream. To hear them tell it, life for young children is a never ending series of unfair situations. If you're a parent, you've probably sometimes countered their complaints with this less than sympathetic response. Too bad, life's not fair. The sooner you learn that, the better off you'll be. Which, by the way, doesn't usually help the situation. When our kids were young, I was determined to eradicate this phrase from their vocabulary. It drove me crazy. Our kids got a small allowance that increased with age so that they could learn to manage money. But they knew that if I that they uttered the evil words, that's not fair, the week's allowance was gone. Along with the punishment was the explanation, you're right, life's not fair. And if it was fair, you'd be far worse off than you are, probably living in a mud hut and sharing your room with four siblings. Now, I don't know if that's the median life situation on this planet or if that was a politically correct thing to say, but the point was loud and clear for them. For you, life is better than fair. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and at about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to a work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired the last the same I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. For all of my insistence with my children that fairness is not something we should seek, I have a pretty overdeveloped sense of fairness myself. Have you ever taken a Myers-Briggs personality assessment? Mine changes a little bit each time I take it, but the last letter never budges. I am a J. That means that I have strong opinions about the way things should be. Here's how one website describes this personality type. They live in a world of clear, verifiable facts. 
They can earn a reputation for inflexibility, and on and on and on. So here's what this looks like when I'm driving. My husband Raj says, why don't you get in the turn lane? I say, because I'm not at the part with the dotted line yet. He says, you're allowed to get in before that. Other people do. And I say, well, they shouldn't. I might carry it a little bit too far. Which is why this parable bugs me so much. When the landowner went to the marketplace to hire workers, he told the first group that he'd pay a denarius, which was the going rate for a day of labor. To the subsequent hires, he promised to pay whatever is right. It's simple math. If I worked from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. for one denarius, that's a rate of 1 12th of a denarius per hour. So the laborer who started at 9 a.m. should get 3 quarters of a denarius, the one who started at noon, half, and so on. That would be fair. At the end of the day, the foreman began with the last hired and paid them all a denarius, to which the first people hired objected, saying essentially, that's not fair. Isn't it funny how the notion of fair never occurs to us until we measure what happens to us beside what happens to someone else? Imagine that the first hired were the only ones hired. At the end of the day, they'd have received the agreed upon wage and gone on their way, believing themselves the recipients of a fair day's wage. It's only when others receive the same benefit for less work that life is no longer fair. Why is that? What is fair, really? If you had 3,000 calories worth of food with which to feed a full-grown adult and a child for a day, what would be fair? To divide them in half and give each 1,500 calories? Maybe, but that doesn't really make sense, does it? Because the adult requires more calories per day than the child. So is it more fair to give the adult two-thirds of the food and the child one-third? You see how the notion of what is fair is easily confused because we see it in relative terms. Not so the landowner, who responded, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? When I, like those who worked all day, claim that something is unfair, what I really mean, if I can be brutally honest, is that I didn't come out on top in the situation. If I had, you would hear no complaints, and possibly no gratitude either. In this parable, Jesus revealed three radical ideas. The first is that fair isn't the point. In God's economy, it's not about equal parts, equal experiences, equal gifting. It's about mishpat. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word mishpat is the word we translate as justice in English. What's the difference between fairness and justice? Mishpat can refer to retributive justice, like when you commit a crime and then you have to make it up to the person you wronged. But more often, it means a kind of justice that we find throughout the Bible, when the word for justice appears alongside the word for righteousness. Here's one of them. Jeremiah 9.24, I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. And Jeremiah 22.3, thus says the Lord, bring about justice and righteousness. Rescue the disadvantaged and don't tolerate oppression or violence against the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. The Bible Project has an excellent video on justice, and in it they describe this kind of justice. Humans are made in the image of God, and so all humans are equal before God and have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness, no matter who you are. Justice paired with righteousness involves proactively making things right. In the Bible, this pairing is restorative justice, working to return things to the way God intended them to be. Imagine blocks stacked to different heights and individuals standing atop each stack. Restorative justice means that those on a higher level reach a hand down to help those on a shorter stack climb up to meet them. Now fairness would have us add a block to everyone's block tower. Justice, on the other hand, raises the lower tower until the two stand on common ground. When we read this parable, we are tempted to imagine that those hired last were lazy or that they didn't try as hard. But what if they'd been waiting since 5 a.m.? 
the same as those hired first, and simply weren't chosen until the end. Does that give them less of a right to make a wage to support a family? Or perhaps they arrived late because they had a sick family member to care for before heading to the marketplace. Maybe a sandal strap broke, and they had to mend it before leaving home. We jump to conclusions based on limited information instead of allowing for more than meets the eye. We imagine ourselves excellent judges of every situation and react by saying, no fair, and assuming that we've been wronged. In our parable, the landowner practiced restorative justice, allowing each participant in the work to end up with a day's wage, no matter their starting point. That's fair to the 6 a.m.ers and more than fair to the 5 p.m.ers, because fair isn't the point. In the pressing, you are breaking your wine. In the shore, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. Yes, you are, Lord. Yes, you are breaking new I'm Kathy Ingram. I'm the director of Heart of the City Kids. Uh, here at Heart of the City Kids, we believe children learn through play. So we teach their lessons through fun games and activities and songs and, and all that good stuff. We just get to lay the foundation and teach the kids from, from babies on that God loves them and they're special. God made them and God made the grass and the animals. It's just fun. I think that's important for families. Um, parents want a place to go to church and to see that we think their children are just as important as they are. You know, the rooms are nice, they're safe, they're secure, and uh, it's just important to, you know, I grew up in this church, so I've been here for a long, long time, and we hope that's what happens with this space, that these children's children come here too. My, 
My favorite space is the indoor play space, not because the slide is super fast, <laughs> but because the, uh, you know, it's important for kids to have physical activity and when it's raining or cold, uh, they now have a place where they can go and let off that steam. It's gonna help teachers' sanity and children's physical development. The second thing Jesus revealed in this parable is that it's God's prerogative to be generous. Translators and editors of our English Bibles have titled this parable, The Workers in the Vineyard. But it's not really about the workers. Verse 1 begins, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. So a better title might be The Generous Landowner. Always before I have read this parable and interpreted it like this. Some people have followed Jesus for their whole lives and they will get to go to heaven when they die. But some people have a deathbed conversion, and they too get to go to heaven when they die. And although that seems colossally unfair to me, I decide that I shouldn't begrudge them that. I may even go so far as to admit that I, as a six-year-old convert, also received the benefit of knowing Jesus my whole life, and they didn't. And I feel a little smug. As I've said, I really missed the point before. Because like I told my children, if life was fair, you'd be worse off than you currently are. I'd be worse off than I currently am. Here's what that means to me. If life was fair, I would get what I deserve. The equation for fair looks like this. My sin equals my death. I chose to act contrary to the will of my creator, and for that, the consequence should be death. But because it's God's prerogative to be generous, this is the equation for justice. My sin plus Jesus' death equals my life. Do you see? God, like the generous landowner, will never give us less good than what we deserve. But he actually wants to give us so much more than what we deserve. He wants to give us a reward that we didn't, we could never earn. We can't work hard enough to earn salvation. And this is why I've never liked this parable. I thought I was the 6 a.m. worker, and now I know that I'm the 5 p.m.er. The distance between what I've earned and what God has given me is vast. The prophet Isaiah gave us a little hint of this more than we've earned when he said this, after he, referring to Jesus, has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. That's a fancy word for sin. Suddenly my reaction is different because I'm no longer indignant that others got the same as me. As a 5 p.m.er, I am overwhelmed with gratitude that I am the recipient of extravagant generosity. The focus of this parable is not the workers in the vineyard, but the generosity of the landowner, because it's God's prerogative to be generous. Gratitude for God's generosity is great, but I don't believe that Jesus wanted his listeners to feel gratitude and stop there. Sometimes it's helpful to take a step back and look at the context surrounding a passage of scripture. Immediately before Jesus told this story, he had an encounter with a rich young man. The man asked what he needed to do to gain eternal life. He'd kept the commandments. In fact, we could maybe describe the man as a 6 a.m.er. He'd worked in the vineyard all day. But he walked away from Jesus sad because Jesus had asked him to sell his possessions and give to the poor. But he couldn't be that radically generous. In essence, Jesus asked him to practice restorative justice, reaching a hand out to those with less, leveling the playing field, standing on common ground. And he couldn't do it. Can I? Can you? The third thing Jesus revealed in this parable is the same thing he told the rich young man, that we too must be generous. The recipients of grace must extend grace. Those who've been blessed must bless. I'm not talking about exercising run-of-the-mill charity. Don't hear me wrong, charity is good. But often we help others out of a sense of obligation or to check a box. We give out of our excess and it costs us little if anything. Simple charity is like looking down on that person on a lower level and handing them something that will help. Radical generosity is reaching down and lifting them up with you. 
Years ago, my friend Sally had her middle school age sons go through their closets to find things to give to some people in need of clothes. Naturally, they went through their things and chose the items they no longer wore, things they'd outgrown or things that were out of fashion. When they showed Sally, she said to them, go get your favorite jeans. And she asked her boys to give their favorite jeans to the boys who needed them, not their excess, their favorites. No matter who you are or what your situation is, you have something someone else doesn't have. What is it? A pair of jeans? Is it money, intelligence, talent, self-confidence, an in with influential people, a relationship with God? How willing are you to share what you have with others? In our parable, it's unclear why the landowner kept returning to the marketplace for more help. Did he underestimate the amount of work to be done? It seems really unlikely that someone in his position would underestimate his labor needs four times. Or did he have the resources to support those in need of work and continue seeking out those whom he could employ for that reason? When we were in college and grad school at UVA, Raj and I were married with a young child and another on the way. Money was tight. I kept track of every penny. I could often be heard grumbling, I hate money, to which Raj would say, that's because you don't have any. People could and did look at us and think that we were irresponsible. We'd made choices they wouldn't have. We had different priorities and we had brought the struggle upon ourselves. Maybe that was true. Raj had a professor who approached him once and asked him if he needed groceries. That was really kind and pretty humbling. A conversation ensued and the Dean of the Commerce School was aware of our situation and then quietly shared it with some understanding colleagues. Then Raj got a letter in the mail inviting him to a ceremony where he would be awarded a scholarship to cover his last year of tuition. He hadn't applied for the scholarship. I'm not sure it even existed before then. And to this day, we don't know exactly what happened behind the scenes. But it was pretty clear to us that those who had resources, those who had influence, they saw a place where they could extend radical generosity and they acted on it. When they realized that the scholarship was for in-state tuition and we were out-of-state students, they did what it took to make Raj a Virginia resident. They didn't have to do any of this. They could have made assumptions about our situation or labeled us as undeserving or just turned away and let someone else deal with it. But they went out of their way more than once to give us more than what we had earned and it made all the difference to us. The landowner in our parable could have gone out at 6 a.m., employed the original workers, and felt good about himself. But he exercised radical generosity by employing more and more workers and then by giving them more than what they deserved. God sent his son in an act of radical generosity. He didn't give out of his excess. He gave his very self, his son, he sent Jesus to earth to fulfill the equation that justice demanded. And in his act of radical generosity, he provided us with a way to climb up and stand in his presence. Shouldn't we respond by extending that same radical generosity to others? Life isn't fair, and aren't you glad? It's God's prerogative to be generous, and aren't you grateful? We too must be generous. Let's not wait another minute.
We are so glad you were with us today for TV Church. I'm Travis Collins, Senior Pastor here at First Baptist Huntsville. And I'm Lisa Greer CC. I'm a member of First Baptist and a member of the Tennessee Valley Church team. We like to say we're church at the heart of the city with a heart for the region. Wherever you're watching from, we're glad you've joined us and we'd love to connect with you. There are three places you can connect. Look around and find helpful resources. Check out our Facebook page, our website at fbchsv.org, and take a look at tvchurch.info. At tvchurch.info, you'll even find a short downloadable booklet that I wrote with you in mind, Stuff I Wish I'd Learned in Sunday School. We're in the middle of summer now with lots of great opportunities for all ages. We hope you'll take a look at all the goings on at and around FBC this summer and join us. You heard Kristen on the program today talk about one of Jesus' parables that reminds us that we don't always get what we deserve, and that's a good thing. It makes us grateful for God's grace. Let's close today with these words from the Bible. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Hi, I'm Ella Kate, and I'm a kid here at First Baptist Church. And I'm Monica Rose, and I am a kid here at FBC. I like this little toy because on each wooden panel it hits, it makes a little different noise. Ta-da! We love our new kids center because there's a stage, fun lights, and a lot of room to dance around. And plus, we put our handprints underneath all this wood. Okay, I like my new Sunday school room because it's new and colorful and excited. And I really like it because I get to be with all my friends and ha also plus have a good time. This is the room I do worship care in. And there's lots of stuff and there's puzzles and lots of games and books. I like this room because it's happy and cheery and it has lots of colors. This is the room where I do worship care. It's bright and colorful, and I enjoy helping the kids while their parents go to church service. 